Hi, welcome to Frequently Asked Fridays, or I get to answer your questions. So if you have a question about uh, anything that has to do with resuscitation and baby's transitions, I'm going to be answering them on Frequently Asked Fridays. So you can um, go to my website, karenstrange.com, and email me from the Contact Karen page. You can uh, just drop me an email at info at karenstrange.com with your question, excuse me, and uh, you can post on Facebook and I will happily answer those questions. So let's see, a couple of questions. So CPM in Michigan, if a baby is born with a, without a heartbeat, what would you still wait to do chest compressions after five effective ventilation breaths? So um, you always, on newborn babies always begin with clearing the fluid in the lungs. It's a waste of time to do chest compressions before then. So my recommendation is you do five inflation breaths. Those are the ones that have a little more pressure for a little more time. They're meant to meet the resistance of the fluid in the lungs. It takes about five fetal lung fluid. Each breath is about two to three seconds, and if you're doing five, that runs about 15 seconds. Hopefully, you see chest wall movement after five or by five. If not, you would need to do your ventilatory corrective steps, you know, reposition um, the mask, uh, re reapply the mask, reposition the head, make sure you have a good open airway. Then you would do another five if the first five didn't do anything. After you do five effective breaths that have actually gone in, you could do some ventilation breaths, which are half the pressure and half the amount of time meant to oxygenate the heart muscle. Then if you still have a heart rate below 60, that's after 30 seconds of positive pressure ventilation, which you have just done, you can then begin chest compressions. It's a waste of time to do chest compressions before you have cleared the fluid because you can't oxygenate the heart muscle or even get the heart muscle going until you have cleared the fluid, dilated those capillaries, and oxygenated the heart muscle. So you always do 30 seconds of effective positive pressure ventilation before you begin chest compressions. Always, always. There is never an exception when it comes to newborn babies. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> What's the difference between skin to skin and kangaroo care? Good question, very good question. I was just at the skin to skin booth at ICM. Um, so let's see. So skin to skin would be the baby being skin to skin, meaning no clothes, no clothes on the baby, maybe a diaper, um, no clothes on the mom. The baby is wrapped onto the, baby, the mother's skin, skin to skin. Kangaroo care is wearing your baby, for sure. You can wear your baby and have clothes on, for sure. Skin to skin is what is critical. It is the, skin to skin involves smell and contact. And those are the critical sensory needs of the brain, is smell and contact. Skin to skin, I mean, all babies should be worn, for sure. Those carriers are, um, we're sort of carrier crazy in this society. When if you wear the baby, have the baby tied to you, you have use of two hands instead of lugging the carrier and schlepping it from here to here. Not to mention what happens for the baby is the baby, when it's near the only thing it knows, which is its mother's heartbeat, her respiration, the vibration of her talking, that helps um, lower cortisol levels in the baby. That helps the baby feel safe. And when they feel safe, their brain is able to grow and um, uh, develop creativity and, because when the baby is not with the only thing that it knows, which is mother's body, is it often feels terror or feels separated and lost. So if there's any way to wear your baby, that's a good thing to do. Kangaroo care um, to do activities and do things, but skin to skin should be done for sure. 
especially with very young babies. And as often as possible, skin to skin, uh, especially premature babies, babies in the hospital, and sometimes even in baby-friendly hospitals, you have to really fight to get your baby's skin to skin. So I encourage you to do what it takes to get the support to help you with the staff, um, whether your hospital is baby friendly or not, to really get that baby on you. Because sometimes, especially when babies need extra help, they still um, can be worn skin to skin. It's just, it takes a little more staff to make that happen. So I just talked with some, um, someone that had a, a, a premature baby and how she really fought to have that baby on her chest. And it was a baby-friendly hospital. That's what they promoted. But she said it was a real chore because it took an extra nurse to do it. And it would be just so much easier if they waited. And But not for your baby. Skin to skin heals. The baby skin to skin um, helps your baby feel safe. It smells you, it feels you, it hears you. This is critical to the critical sensory needs of the brain is smell and contact. So I really encourage as much skin to skin as possible. Um, kangaroo care for sure, if you have activities and you're going out of the house and all of that, which I'm hoping you are not doing, at least for the first two to three weeks. To the first two to three weeks, you should be in bed, skin to skin, not doing anything, hanging out with your baby. And if you have children, so what? Hang out in bed with your children, with your baby, skin to skin. That allows your baby to feel safe. And in safety, growth occurs, growth and expansion and creativity and brain development not in the little swingy thing, not in the little uh, carriers, but skin to skin. Okay, I hope I didn't overdo that for you. Um, so I'll skip down. There's a midwife from California says, what's the golden hour? This is great. Uh, it goes right with skin to skin. The golden hour is the hour after birth, though I would say it extends more than the first hour. Um, I do a whole presentation on the golden hour. And if you're at all interested in knowing about the golden hour and what is embedded in the golden hour, um, you can watch one of my videos called The Baby's Experience of Birth. And um, the sacred hour tools for healing because that is where the repair occurs that is where healing occurs when things did not go as planned that is the best place for it um, and it's already embedded in the normal sequence of birth so uh, the golden hour is the hour after birth it's um, when the baby has left the inner womb, which it knows you by its sound, again, its smell, its taste, its vibration, your talking, your breathing. So when the baby comes out and then goes back onto your chest, skin to skin, not kangaroo mother care, but skin to skin. Um, and this is the hour that is really protected. In fact, um, Dr. Nils Bergman says the first thousand hours are uh, a critical period for the baby. So um, the first hour, though, I would say the first several hours and the first several weeks are actually critical. And um, the more help you can get to allow this to happen, the better, because again, the same thing is what happens. The baby feels safe because babies not on the outer womb after birth feel incredible terror because there's only one thing babies know. They know you. They know the sound of you. They know how you move, how you, you're breathing, all of that. That's what they know. When they're not with the only thing they know, they feel terror. So our job as, as parents and birth providers is to protect this golden hour where healing occurs, where the baby's cortisol levels start to drop from, from the birth experience, even if something happened like a C-section, or it was a long labor, or maybe there were uh, uh, forceps or vacuum, or maybe there were drugs on board, um, or maybe it was just a difficult, challenging labor. This 
is where the baby feels safe. This is where the baby begins to heal, not by you doing things, but by you creating sort of the outer womb of safety, this place where the baby can feel safe. And in safety, growth and healing occurs. The baby cannot feel safe in an incubator or in an isolate right next to you, even with your little hand on there. That is not what helps babies feel safe. This is where babies feel safe. And this is also where babies tell their story of what happened. And it's our job to listen and hear what babies have to say about their journey to be born. And uh, again, I go through all of that in the sequence of birth on the website. I, I hope you listen to it. Um, okay, let's see. We'll go back to... <coughs> Excuse me, just <coughs> getting over bronchitis. Um, a midwife in Mississippi says, when do you stimulate? So I really want to be clear about this. And my um, next webinar is the top five failures in neonatal resuscitation and how to avoid them. And I'm going to be showing some videos on uh, what to avoid. So I hope you tune in for that. That's karenstrange.com backslash webinars. But um, so. So it's pretty clear. The literature makes it clear that the process of birth and the drying of the baby is enough stimulation. Maybe, maybe a brief period of further stimulation. That's all. If your baby doesn't come around, you don't need to keep stimulating and rubbing. You need to stop and move on to ventilations, effective ventilations. And you shouldn't be stimulating and rubbing and flicking while you're ventilating because it's hard to ventilate a baby. It's hard to keep that airway open and get a good seal. So stop all rubbing and stimulating while you're ventilating. Once the baby's breathing, you don't need to be smacking the baby around and slapping the baby and percussing and rubbing some more. Your ventilating should be till the baby is breathing and breathing well. So you could stimulate a little teeny tiny bit. The birth process and drying the baby is all very stimulating. That's usually enough to get a baby in primary apnea breathing. There's no need to do more stimulation. And this is something that people tend to do because they're afraid of ventilating. So they often don't ventilate enough and they don't, um, they put off ventilating and stimulate. So uh, if you really understand what it takes to clear the fluid in the lungs, uh, what babies need that are not breathing and not breathing well, they don't need more stimulation. They need help with what the problem is. And the problem isn't shocking the baby into its body because the idea is that you avoid ventilating, so you rub, 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 hoping the baby finally goes, Ugh! takes enough breath, which to me is not the gentlest, least traumatic way to help a baby breathe. The gentlest, least traumatic way is to do for the baby what the baby cannot do for itself, and that is to help the baby breathe by ventilating. And I go into that in part one of my Beyond the Basics resuscitation of the webinar series. So uh, if you have any question or you're confused, please. Um, check that out. And if you have further questions on that, please get back to me. I look forward to um, answering your questions. Again, email me at info at karenstrange.com. Post it on Facebook. Um, your questions, these will be posted on Friday night. Look forward to answering your questions. Bye now.